name is Chris Durham. Welcome to another episode of Drinks from Eddie Muller's Noir Bar. Each week I take a chapter from the book Eddie Muller's Noir Bar, Cocktails Inspired by the World of Film Noir, and I talk about the film in that chapter and I make the drink associated with it. Today we're going to be looking at the film Shadow of a Doubt and making the drink The Merry Widow. Now, Shadow of a Doubt was released in 1943. It was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and it stars Joseph Cotton and Teresa Wright. Now, this film was the favorite film of Alfred Hitchcock of his own films, uh, which goes to show just how good a film that is. Now, when you think Alfred Hitchcock, you may not necessarily think um, film noir, but... You know, I think that's mostly because he tended to be a a genre unto himself. I mean, so basically, when you think of Alfred Hitchcock films, you don't necessarily think of a certain genre. You think of comparing it to other Alfred Hitchcock films. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. But there's some that definitely fall into the film noir genre. Uh, definitely Strangers on a Train. Uh, I think you make an argument for Notorious. Myself, I think Vertigo is probably his best film noir. He, um, although not necessarily my favorite, but it's, I think that, you, you know, when you think about film noir, you think about black and white and shadows, but I think Vertigo uses color in much the same way that cinematographers in traditional film noir use black and white. So I think Vertigo falls right in there and definitely Shadow of a Doubt falls right in there. Now, the story is about uh, Teresa Wright's character. She is a young woman, I'm guessing probably 18, 19 years old. I get the impression she's out of high school, but not very far out of high school. Um, she is very bored with her life. She feels like she and her family are in a complete rut, and she needs somebody to come shake, shake them up. And the first thing she thinks of is she thinks of her Uncle Charlie for whom she is named. So her name is Charlie and she has an Uncle Charlie and she's always felt a very, very strong connection with her Uncle Charlie, um, both emotionally, but also psychically, like they're they're in tune with each other. Um, and in many respects, there is kind of a connection there. I mean, to be honest with you, in a way they are very, very similar, but different sides of the same co coin she is very very innocent and and good and he is very not good <laughs> and and just sinister um but they do have that commonality between them um so she gets the idea that she thinks that uncle charlie should come vi visit them so he she goes down to the telegraph office send him a telegram to ask him to come and she finds out that he's already sent one to them saying that he is on his way coming to town which makes her think this psychic connection she has with him is all the more real now um i'd like to this is what happens when uncle charlie shows up is it's a lot of caring and bonding and nurturing and um no not really um uncle charlie is definitely not what she expected or remembered out of her uncle um he kind of opens her eyes to a world she was totally un unaware of and brings to this little town um this little innocent town something that they have never seen before um and you know this this monster that his uncle charlie is packaged in a very good looking very suave very rich very well-spoken man but he is he's a monster so um the the other thing I want to mention about this um, film is something I picked up in a college course I took on on film. And one of the things that you see in Shadow of a Doubt is you see a lot. Uh, Hitchcock was really playing with the idea of duality. Um, you have two characters named Charlie. Um, you see a lot of times characters are paired up in twos. Um, there are two detectives, which kind of goes along. I mean, most of the time you have two detectives. That's the way they work but you have two siblings and two siblings the two siblings 
uh, the younger brother and the younger sister are in a way like Charlie and Uncle Charlie in that they're very similar, but very, very different at the same time. Both are very, very smart. Both are very precocious. But the daughter is is into fantasy and reading and the son is into math and counting and, and figuring things out. Um, there are two characters, uh, the father and the next door neighbor who are mystery fans. And I, that's where a lot of the humor in this film comes from is the two neighbors talking about mysteries, talking about murders, talking, coming up with ways that they would kill each other. And all the while they have this monster living among them. It's, it's really great. Um, it's not just the characters. You see it in visual motifs. Uh, at one point, Charlie is sitting in bed, eating, uh, having breakfast in bed, and he's wearing a double-breasted pair of pajamas, which, like, that's a thing. Um, uh, Charlie, the niece, she's often wearing a coat that has, that has two buttons very up high on the collar that are very prominently displayed. I mean, she probably has other buttons on the coat, but that's, those are the ones you see all the time. Um, you know, when she runs into her friends, it's always two friends that she runs into. When Uncle Charlie takes her to a bar, they go to the Tilt Two Club and Uncle Charlie orders two double brandies. Um, now you can say, oh, well, this, this was probably just a coincidence. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think there was anything in an Alfred Hitchcock movie that was a coincidence. I think he planned everything all the way down to the very minutest detail and made sure that happened because that was what he thought was interesting about making films. I mean, the, the idea of working on the script, planning the shots, planning how it was going to be shot, planning what things were wearing, how characters were paired off together. I think that was all part of his process and a part of a process that I don't think anything slipped by him at all. I mean, even, you know, I mean, I just think he, he had it completely under his, under his control. Um, if you do get a chance to see this film in the theater, a lot of times, especially this time of year, it's October. Um, a lot of, a lot of theaters will do Hitch, Hitch, ah, Hitchcocktober fests. So they'll show, um, Alfred Hitchcock movies. If anyone is showing Shadow of a Doubt and you get a chance to see it in the theater, you really should. It's a great, great film to see in the theater. There's a, um, a speech that Joseph Cotton makes about women and, you know, rich widowed women who, you know, drink too much, eat too much to, you know, spend all their money, money that their husbands work their lives for. And it's just sinister as hell. And, and of course, uh, niece Charlie is listening to the Teresa's right is listening to this and she's like, but they're human beings. And he turns to the camera and he just goes, are they? And, and seeing Joseph Cotton's face about 12 feet tall as he, as he turns to deliver that line is just, it's just chilling. It's, it's one of the greatest things you can ever experience in a theater. It really is cool. So the drink, the Merry Widow, um, this is kind of a vamp on the martini and we will ba be back in a flash to make that drink. So stick around. Thanks. And we're back. So we're going to start. Now this is the Merry Widow. It's kind of a take on the martini. Um, going to load up our stirring glass with ice. And good. Okay. And then we're going to start with an ounce and a half of gin. And then we're going to do an ounce and a half of dry vermouth, which is Dolan, just one of the ones that Eddie recommends. And also a lot of online bartenders will recommend this one. So there we go. And then we're going to have a half ounce of Benedictine. So a half ounce of Benedictine. And then we're going to have two dashes of absinthe, which again, I don't have a way of dashing absinthe. So I'm just going to go with a little less than half a bar spoon of the absinthe. 
Oops, that's probably a little bit much, so I'm not going to put it all in there. Just move that off to the side. And then two dashes. Where did my lemon go? And two dashes. There we go. Of Peychaud's Bitters. And we're going to give it a nice stir. Okay, and then we're going to strain it into a chilled coupe glass. And I just realized I forgot something else. I forgot the lemon for the lemon peel garnish. So I'll be back in a flash. <laughs> <laughs> and magically the limit appears. Okay, so I've got this peeler, which I'm going to try. I don't usually use this one. This one produces a very long, skinny peel of lemon. So I'm going to give that a shot. Okay. And now I'm going to kind of <laughs> wrap it up and... And then I think I'm going to wrap it around my finger so that I get a nice tight coil. And drop it in. Okay, so now we have the Merry Widow. That's really nice. Um, I'm not really... It's definitely different. I'm getting the, I'm kind of getting the Benedictine a lot, um, but it's there's a lot going on in this drink. It's it's a really nicely well balanced drink. Anyway, so from a booth in the back of uh, Eddie Muller's Noir Bar, we're going to see Cheers. We're going to see Cheers. We're <laughs> drinking up these. I'll be, definitely be seeing Cheers. Um, we're going to say Cheers. And I hope you join us next week for another episode of Drinks from Editing Muller's Noir Bar. Thanks for coming. Bye.